That's cold. That's right. Thanks for joining us, fellas. Coach Early, whenever you're settled, if you just want to give some opening thoughts before we open up to questions, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, excited to get uh, another opportunity this year uh, in an Elite Eight game to uh, you know, play a really high quality team and uh, you know, have a chance to, uh, you know, 40 minutes or however long it takes for a chance to get back to a Final Four. Excellent. Thank you. Open up the questions here. Up front. Dave Borges, Hearst, Connecticut Media. Dan, um, d does Illinois remind you of any teams you've played this year or any Big East teams with you know, their physicality or their, their offensive punch or anything like that? Is there, can you draw any similarities between any teams you've played? I think um, you know, there's, there's different elements with the, with the, way, that we, uh, the way that they space the court. Um, you know, with, you know, with Marquette um, in terms of the offensive end, you know, although you know Marquette is unique, um, you know some some defensive principles from maybe from Creighton. You know, there's just like different elements. Obviously, we, you know, you, we we, uh, you know, we we watched their game versus Marquette in the non-conference. You know, the one that they played at Illinois. So there was, um, you know, some some familiarity, uh, you know, coming in. Here in the middle, John Fans of Fox Sports. This is for any of the players. Uh, we've talked with Coach quite a bit, and Coach has talked with us quite a bit about his uh, list of superstitions. What do you guys think of, of uh, Coach's superstitions? And have you developed any? Have you developed any uh, as a result of, of all of the things he has? Um, I mean, whatever works, works. So, I mean, it's, it's working well for, you know, his entire coaching career. So, um why not continue it? So, I mean, I've definitely picked on the superstitious stuff, whether that's with socks or um, Cam and I waiting for each other to get in the hotel room. Like, I have to go first, and he's got to wait, and then I got it, then he's got to go. So, um, oh, yeah, it's just weird superstition. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. You, can talk about you know what I'm talking yeah, about. That's true. He knows what I'm talking about. Anything else? All right, go ahead. There in the middle. Uh, Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Uh, just a quick one for Dan, then one for Tristan. I, I, genuine question here, because you got the thing with the M&Ms. The M&M blue is a different shade than Illinois blue, so is that going to be a factor when you decide what we're doing before this game tomorrow? I didn't even know. I, I, I thought I was safe, because I, I, I didn't even realize they had the blue in there. I was so focused on the orange. Okay, all right. So, okay, you hadn't thought about it. Not a, not a full scout there. Tristan, um, <laughs> This team this year versus the team from last year, what element is here that gives you uh, confidence that maybe was missing or just maybe a dial down when, it t when we talk about being a team like Illinois, getting to the Final Four? What's the biggest dynamic difference from this group versus last season? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's, you know, besides the, you know, players, obviously, but um, last year we had the, you know, same formula, defense, rebounding, uh, sharing the ball that got us to a national championship, and we carried that over to this year. And we've had a successful year, so um, I don't see that many differences besides the players. Um, we got the same, you know, we do the same routine, we do the same scout, and, you know, we prepare the same, so I wouldn't say there are too many big differences. Thanks, Tristan. Hearing back? This is for Coach uh, Sam Knox, WPRI in Providence. Uh, you talk about culture uh, a lot. What's it like in real time to see that happen in, in such dominating fashion, especially in the tournament? Yeah, um, just the... You know the the culture piece. Um, it's it's all about just getting the right right t the right people together, like minded people, um, people that are willing to sacrifice, people that are willing to care. Uh, you know, care about the group. Um, you know, s you know, sacrifice. Uh, you know, parts of themselves uh, for the for the overall success of the group. Because um, everyone's going to get what they deserve in the end. You know, there's no more secrets. You know, players that are. NBA level players, they're going to get drafted. You're going to play in the NBA. You know, it's not like it was years ago where there's these guys that you know, you know don't don't end up making it because uh, you know they, they were some hidden secret. You know, everyone's going to end up playing at the level uh, that the talent dictates. Um, you know, so while you're wearing the college uniform, you know, play for the win. And we got guys that that play to win. Thanks, Coach Jimmy. Jimmy Golan, Associated Press, Donovan. Uh, Coach talked the other day about you coming in after last year and saying you weren't ready, you wanted to come back. What went into that decision? What did you think wasn't ready and, and was um, was having the chance to win two in a row any part of that decision? Yeah, I mean, you know, 
I love I love you know UConn. I love being here. I love you know the guys in the locker room. I love the coaching staff. Um, you know I'm you know I really you know feel like I wanted to come back and you know just prove what I could do. And you know the college games as fun as it gets. And you know winning a national championship. You know definitely wanted to try to compete for another one. And you know just because I realized you know how fun it is and you know how great winning is. So you know I just wanted to come back and you know try to battle and just do it with a new team. Was it more about the experience, or was there a part of their game, your game that you still wanted to work on? Um, you know, everything. You know, obviously, you know, there's always room for improvement. You know, obviously, I wanted to get better. I always want to, you know, I just want to do a new team. And you know, like I said, I love UConn. I love being here. And you know, I just want to just keep winning. Good job. All right, guys. Let's play a little game here. Uh, let's describe your coach in one word. Each one of you. All right. I'll start if you want. You want me to start, Donovan? Sure. Yeah. Lunatic. I like that one. Who said that? Right? You said I that? Said, no, I no, said it. No, no, I said it. Let them say it. Why do I'm, you I'm want starting. it? You're prompting them. They can't use them. that word, though. They gotta, you, you gotta try. You're taking them you in a direction, to come out with though. a different word. You're like leading them. No, not at all. I would never lead. Who starts? Go ahead, Steph. Let's, let's start down with you, Stefan. We'll go down the road. Um, loud. Uh, competitive. Passionate. Dang, you took my word. Oh, <laughs> Uh, relentless. A winner. Let's go, boys. They got my back. <laughs> they got my back. That's right. Culture. <laughs> right here, then I'll go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, Trevor House with the Boston Globe. Question for uh, Tristan and Alex. Just curious about Cam's versatility. Obviously, he's a shooter. Everyone knows that. But his passing, his playmaking, can you get to speak to the way he affects the game in so many ways? Yeah, I mean, he could beat he could beat anybody in so many different ways, whether that's his shot or just playmaking for others. And um, he really just helps us create a new look offensively and just, you know, teams worry about him so much. And, you know, he's extremely unselfish. So he's either going to make the shot or, you know, make the unselfish play. And um, he's just super easy and super fun with to play on, on offense. Yeah, I mean, Tim's a, uh, Cam's a great teammate. You know, he, he wants, he's going to do whatever it takes to win. Uh, he dives on the floor. He gets steals. He moves the ball. You know, he obviously shoots well. And, uh, with his shooting skill, he, he can get to the basket and make plays. So uh, he's an all-around great player, and he's, he's been good for our team this year. Thanks. Right here in front. Uh, Zach Brazil in your opposed. Dan, did you have superstitions when you were a player? And what were they? Well, that's a long time ago. Um, no. I just think you have more time as a coach. You're, you're in the locker room by yourself, especially as a head coach. You're in the locker room by yourself for a while, just by yourself, and you have a lot of time by yourself. So it just it, it, it leads to the, these things piling up. What about St. Benedict's? Yeah, I mean, that started there. I think the M&M's probably started there. Anything else? There? Um, just prayer, you know. I, I pray, too, right before um, we talk to these guys. They go out at the eight-minute mark. I, I, go, I go and say a quick prayer. Um, so my faith's always been real important to me. You're in back. Okay. Tara Sullivan from the Boston Globe. Cam, you've probably been asked this before, but the comparison of kind of Big East basketball, what you went through this season versus Big Ten basketball, you're going to play them. So, yeah, just it, are they similar? Or did one harder, more physical, anything, any comparison you might make? Yeah, I, I would say the physicality is pretty similar. Um, you know, big, strong, athletic people uh, in both leagues. Uh, I think the Big East probably a little bit faster. The, the Big Ten probably a little more of a, a half-court offense kind of a league. Um, but like I said, a very, both very physical leagues. Here in front. Uh, Donald Mori, Hartford Current. Uh, Alex and, and Dan also, if you could weigh in on this. but. Uh, it's been said in the past, Gino, among others, that this regional final, the eight, is the hardest obstacle along the way to the final, to, to the championship. This is the toughest game. I was wondering, you know, Alex, you went through this last year with Gonzaga. What were, what were the feelings like going into that game? And then, Dan, if you could maybe speak to that as well. Yeah, we were super energetic just knowing how hard it is to make it to the Elite Eight and just, you know, the energy that surrounds the Elite Eight. So we were super excited. And, um, making it back to the Elite Eight, it's special. And, you know, it's hard to do it two times in a row. But I think every game is hard in March Madness. The first round, second round, all of them are hard. And they all, you know, equal the same value. You win, you move on. So really, you're just super energized and excited about all of them. And, you know, you're just blessed to be in the opportunities in these type of games. Yeah. I mean, first round games are rough. Um, 
Yeah, I, mean, I remember last year, uh, you know, pretty nerve wracking going into this one with everything that's on the table. Um, and then going into the national championship game, not wanting to lose, <laughs> losing the national championship game. But this year for us, I think feels different. You know, we broke through last year. We've established a level. Maybe we feel a little bit less pressure as an organization because we feel like we've established a level now that uh, of where our program's at, that um, you know, we're, we're going to be in this spot moving forward, um, obviously this year and, and moving forward. So I don't think we feel the same anxiety. We have tremendous respect for our opponent, know how hard tomorrow's going to be. But um, you know, we've established a level that we expect to be back to. Uh, great. Dan, Mikey Anthony from Hearst. What do you recall about the conversations with Donovan coming off of last year uh, and his need to come back this year? And what do you think of his body of work this year and, and his development despite some injuries? Yeah, I think with, with Donovan, you know, listen, the, obviously NIL and, um, you know, has changed things for, you know, for, for college athletes. Um, you know, th there's no rush to get to, you know, professional sports, the NBA, the NFL. Uh, with, with what you can earn as a college athlete, if you're physically and mentally and emotionally not ready to go into a man's world and like your game is not there, you're emotionally, you know, in, in terms of your uh, maturation, not ready to be in that world, like with grown ass men, like, you know, fighting for your life on a, on a daily basis in that league, then, you know, you should return to college until you're prepared to like, be a rotation player in the NBA where you can have a long and successful career. The objective is not getting drafted to the NBA. The objective is to have a 12 to 15 year career in the NBA. And Donovan wasn't, you know, wasn't ready for that last year. And, and he was very, he's a very self-aware kid. Um, you could see his impact once he's healthy. Um, he wasn't healthy to start the year. Now he's healthy. Uh, he's in great form. And, uh, um, and there's few players in the country that impact a game like him. Over to the right. I'll follow up with Donovan. Donovan, um, either in the context of this tournament run or the entire season, uh, have you and your teammates taken this season as a title defense, like what you won last year, you are trying to retain what is, what is yours, or has it been, you know, draw a line, blank slate, this is all about moving forward and we're not necessarily using, you know, what we already have as, uh, as extra motivation? Yeah, um, definitely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, after the summer, um, you know, when we got all the new guys and from, you know, the freshmen and, you know, Cam, you know, really just, you know, leaving that in last season and focusing on, you know, doing it with a new team. And um, we really, it's nothing about like defending. It's really just trying to, you know, go out and, you know, win another one and, you know, doing whatever we can to do that. And, you know, it's a special group of guys that, you know, it's coached at the highest level and, you know, we're, we're just ready for, you know, what's ahead of us. Go ahead, Johnny. Uh, I'm going to give Coach a chance to answer this, and then the four other players next to Stefan Castle, I'll give you guys a chance to think. When did you know that this freshman would be the, the perfect fit for your program, and, and what was your first encounter or two like with this kid? Coach? For, for, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, just during, you know, during the unofficial visits, official visits, you know, you spend time around him, you, you – you, you, you get to know Quan and and uh, and Stacy and all the people that Steph has around them, the physical attributes, the traits, um, the competitiveness, you know, the love of the game, all that stuff is there. But you know, for me, it's when you spend time with him on the visit and you know that the family, he's got the right uh, inner circle around him. Yeah, I mean, you know, really his official visits, um, just. You know, the dinners that, you know, the official visit dinners, just hanging around with him on campus. You know, his family's great. You know, he's a good kid. And, um, you know, he's, you know, the best defender that, you know, that you see when, you know, we put him on the best players every game. And, you know, he's he's a special player, a special kid. Anyone else? Tristan. Yeah. Um, I mean, Coach, they do a great job of recruiting the right players. So, you know, obviously if Coach wants somebody to be on our team and he says they're going to help us, they're pretty much going to help us. Uh, my first interaction with Steph was, um, I think on Instagram, honestly. We were talking about uh, the jersey number. Uh, talking about getting number two, he couldn't have it. Nah. But um, besides that, yeah, he's a, he's a great teammate, great guy on and off the court, and uh, glad he's our teammate this year. Thanks, guys. You're in the front left. Joe Ruta, Hartford Current. Uh, 
Dan, could you speak to the different personalities that you have in the backcourt? Obviously, Tristan and Cam and Stefan Haas. And, mm. and how have they been able to mesh? Well, it just, I think, um, you know, I, I think getting, you know, players with a, with a lot of life to them and, and, you know, trying to avoid, like, you know, zombies and deadheads on your roster. Um, just, you know, outgoing, you know, different types of personality. I think it, it helps you in these bigger moments. I think uh, that's something that we spent a lot of time thinking about with, you know, a, a couple of those years where we didn't play our best in March was, you know, get guys that are alive that, that aren't going to shrink, um, you know, when the lights get bright in March. And uh, it's it's a very diverse locker room, and uh, I know they have a lot of a lot of fun in there, and it's 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 a lively it's a lively place. Got about three minutes left. There's two athletes here. Go ahead in the middle. Uh, Rob Doster, Field of 68s for Tristan and Alex. Coach has uh, said multiple times that Donovan's as impactful of a player as there is in college basketball. I'm just curious, in your eyes, what is that impact? I think it starts on the defensive end with him. I mean, when he was out for those five games in the middle of the season, we really weren't as good defensively. We didn't have the rim protection. We didn't have like that presence inside that um, <clears throat> you know intimidated other teams of attacking the paint. So. Really, I think it started with the defensive end with him. And then offensively, I mean, lob throw post ups. He really opens up everything else for the guards and the shooters. So, um, I mean, it was really both ends. But I think more importantly, it was on the defensive end. We needed him. Yeah, I mean, he pretty much covered it all. Like, it starts with defense. You know, he affects all shots around the rims. He gets good rebounds. I think the most underrated uh, part of his game is he's, a, well, for me personally, uh, helps me out. He's a good screen setter. You know, he. I'm open off all his screens, and you know, if it's on the ball or off the ball, he sets great screens, and you know, um, just throw it up to him, he's gonna go get it. So, yeah, he's he's the most impactful player in the country. We would say so. John, did you have a follow? Up? You're good. Okay. Do we have any other questions for uh, for a five up here before we let him head back? No, you guys are all set. Coach, you can stick around for a few more questions. It'd be great. Thank you. Right here to the right. A few. A few. A few. I got you. No, you're good. Steph. Go ahead, Jimmy. Dan, as you may be aware, it's been a long time since anyone's repeated. And I was just wondering, with all the stuff that's going on in the sport these days, do you think it's getting harder to do that with the transfer portal and all that stuff? Or do you think it's maybe going to get easier because you can just bring someone in? Oh, it's harder. Um, it, it, it's way harder. Forget the fact, I mean, coaching's harder. The, the game is way more sophisticated, right? I mean, just the players are more skilled, they're more versatile. So many, um, you know, different types of teams with different, you know, tactics offensively, defensively. Obviously, you're managing your roster with the with the portal, with NIL. Um, I mean, for us, we, you know, we, we've, you know, you better be a more skilled coach these days because you're dealing with a lot more stuff. And then just for, you know, for us, I think, uh, you know, we, we – uh, We've made it look easy um, in, in these past two tournaments, but it's been a, it's hard, you know. We, we we do the hard things really really well, like the defense, the rebounding, you know, the way that we play at the offensive end of the court, um, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's tough. It's not it's not easier. It's going to get tougher, um, you know, in, unless you know somebody isn't you know. So we got like a commissioner or something <laughs> that gets this thing a little bit, uh, you know, more, more organized and under control. We could really use a commissioner. Got such an incredible sport. We got the greatest sport event that this country has on a yearly basis that catch, captures the imagination of the whole country. You know, casuals, not non-sport fans, everybody. Everyone's got a bracket. You know, you got this incredible product that's marketed horribly outside of March. Um, you know, it's an incredible sport and. Uh, yeah, you better be a better coach, and uh, we need a commissioner. Good. Good. Dan, Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Uh, you've been uh, frequent in your outspokenness about your opposition to the transfer portal being open during the tournament. I think a lot of people in your profession would share that opinion. I'm curious, in your position, UConn, uh, if you have found yourself in the past couple of weeks in the rare spot where instead of having a staff that has to work the portal, work the back channels, if anything, You've had people approach either you, your staff, and say, "Hey, how can we how can we get our guys involved in what you're doing?" If you've had to deal with that, if you've almost had to push the brakes on on everyone uh, as you try and do this and kind of keep all your focus on your team. Yeah, we're um, you know we have Tom Moore in a 
in a, in a, a pseudo GM role. Um, you know, obviously trying to project out what the what the roster is going to look like. Obviously, you know, we, we have players that we know that won't return. Then you have some some younger players that that you know um, are going to have heavy heavy interest. Um, you know, in, in in terms of Steph and, and Donovan and and AK. So, um, but. W- w- those things we're, we're kind of having casual conversations about that, but we really are really just trying to focus on next practice, you know, studying the heck out of the, this Illinois team, staying in the moment, staying present um, with that. It, it hasn't hurt us in the past. That's the way we've always handled things. You know, we're not good at tampering or cheating. We've never tried that. Um, and, and we've still been very successful. So, um, you know, we, we want to play out the season, and then obviously you know, we'll deal with our roster situations. But um, you know, we, we just, as a program, you know, we, we want to have a high-level culture and, and the respect of our peers uh, to not be one of those programs that's you know, trying to steal players off other teams in season. Just a quick follow-up with that, because last year you, know, you spoke on how you had to take a few of these Zoom interviews with these transfers. Like... Have you put your, you know, foot down, line in the sand, the whole thing on like, you know, if you're fortunate enough to, to go to Arizona, like we're not doing that again, or is it a state of the business where like it's almost out of your control? For me to, to make... For you specifically in this team, like, you know, that, that must not have been like what you wanted to do a year ago when you're trying to win a title and you're, yeah. and you're hopping, you, you got assistance hopping on a Zoom. <laughs> I'm wondering if you're, if you're intent on not having to repeat that or if it's just an unavoidable reality here. So what we've tried to do is like as, as players have, have gone in that... There may be an interest in based on how some personnel things go for us, either portal or early entry draft. Um, you know, we, we've had like you know Tom, who's acting as a pseudo, you know, GM for us, maybe making an initial call of interest. Um, but yeah, I'm not actively. I think I've I've called a high school player that's available um, and had a had a phone conversation. But I just think it's our practice. Um, you know, for me and Kamani and Luke uh, to, to lock in on team and, and to take this season as far as we can go. And, and you know, if we if we lose players uh, because we're moving slower, um, again, it hasn't hurt us the past two years. Back left, Coach. Dan, you talked about a lot of what college basketball as a whole is facing. <clears throat> the issue of gambling mm. being so out there for those of us of a certain age, that's strange enough to kind of live in a space where gambling is, is so present in there. I'm, I'm curious what you, if, how you feel about that and if, if gambling to you is a threat because like the kids are, you know, could be targeted by people or if it's because they're vulnerable and then you're looking at, you know, bad stuff, point shaving, things like that. What do you see as the threats? I, I think you worry about the people getting close to the players. Um, you know, anyone involved in your program, whether student managers or what have you, I just think the antennas are up. You know, n- now with these play, now with players, you know, with this NIL uh, opportunity, you know, it- it's not like they need to bet, uh, you know, on on games in college with that insider <laughs> information because they need the cash. You know, the- these kids now are, are in a position, uh, um, you know, to to begin investing money, taking care of family, having family travel, NIL has been great. Um, but yeah, you worry about the people around the players and just how easily accessible it is. I mean, we, you know, we we play and practice uh, at the Excel Center, not very far from a window where we could see, you know, the you know the the, the gambling going on. So, let's go to your front left. Uh, Gavin Keith in London Day. Dan, how do you go about building a strong connection with your players and how important is that to your team's success? Time. Uh, you know, you, you invest every second um, that you can in them that the NCAA allows, uh, both on the court, um, you know, and and off the court. It, it truly, you, you just pour everything you have into them, your family, your um, family is intertwined with your program. Um, and um, I think players sense that, they feel that. You know, my players will accept the hard coaching from me. 
um, because uh, and our staff because uh, you know they know how much we love them. They know how much we're trying to prepare them, toughen them up, teach them, help them grow as men, develop new skills quickly. All those things that are going to add value to their lives, and, and we're relentless for them. You know, we're, we're literally giving everything we got to them while they're on campus. Now, I wouldn't want to play for me for 10 years, um, 12 years. I mean, I wouldn't want to play for this staff for 8, 10, 12, 15 years. It, you know, we, we, we go hard for these guys while they're on campus, and that's why I think you, you see the bond the way it is. It's, in some cases, it's, you know, it's eight months, it's 10 months, it's two or three years. You got to do that at a sprinter's pace, you know, um, because it's such a short window where you're trying to prepare these guys for the rest of their lives. Success, the stuff that they need to learn as men. Let's go front and center here. Dan, what's the single most important or maybe the two or three most important pieces of advice that either Jim Calhoun or one of the other you know, veteran coaches that you talk to about handling the later stages of, of March? Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, certainly shortening up practices. I think that um, you know, trusting your team. I think from Coach Calhoun and and and, and Gino, have really tried to hammer that home. Uh, you know, with with me, as the season's gone on, sh shortening those practices. Um, and, and then I think um, you know the you know the the the, the leadership, the public persona. Um, I, I think Gino and. Coach Calhoun have had a heavy influence on how I try to carry myself this time of year as a UConn coach, the, the, the confidence that you've got to display both in-house um, and in front of you guys because, um, because of what, what UConn represents in March and April. Right here, Coach. Jimmy Golan from the Associated Press. Uh, to follow up on what you mentioned about Donovan the other day, what, what is it about his game that – you saw could be could improve if he stuck around and have, what kind of growth have you seen from him and then kind of how remarkable is it for you that a guy can look at the NBA and say no nah, I'm good I'll wait yeah I mean you, you obviously all the defensive things and now that he's healthy all the movement and the ball screen defense plus the rim protection he's got a unique skill set for somebody that's seven two seven three um, you, you could see somebody that's very comfortable like passing and handling the ball away from the basket, which is so critical uh, in the NBA game today with the five out. Um, and, you know, I think um, if you watch him, you know, in pregame warmups, you could see that the shooting eventually at the, uh, as he gets into an NBA organization, you know, you, you'll see the shooting with him. You'll see a guy that eventually will be able to step away and make shots. People see Jokic and what he looks like when he's 25, 26 years old. You know, when he was 20, he wasn't making, you know, 24-foot threes and doing all the things that you're seeing him do the last couple of years. So, you know, Donovan's, um, you know, Donovan has an ability to, uh, um, to develop uh, new skills rapidly and um, – you know, you'll, you'll see that, um, you know, when he gets to the NBA. Was it remarkable to you that he was able to, you know, put off instant gratification? Yeah, um, but, you know, he, he comes, uh, you know, a, a great family raised him, and um, and in Bristol's kept him humble and grounded. And, you know, he, he he's a Connecticut kid. He loves Connecticut. Um, you know, he loves college. He, you know, once these guys leave college, they're not going to be on – teams like this again that feel the way we feel about each other ever again you're going to go into a, an nba organization and it's going to be it's going to be business it's it's going to be it's going to be man you know what um you know that there's it's not going to be like this in, in terms of the way the group feels about each other the brotherhood the camaraderie and i i think you know he wanted another year of that good man well, one more for you, Dan. Um, it has not been a recurring trope for this team to win close games. You had a you know, half there. <laughs> but I am curious how you are trying to guard against or prepare your team for if it's caught in a one-possession game with two minutes to go tomorrow night. Um, or if, if you – do does you and your staff have any control over your team's composure when it comes to that? How much does that weigh on you if you wind up getting – you know, if you're not blowing them out with, with, with at the under four, you know? Yeah. Um, well, we've played under pressure on a daily basis because, 
you know, our, our, our practice is very intense. So I, I do think that helps us um, to a degree. But, you know, at, at MSG, that St. John's game, you know, that was not, um, you know, that, that, that game was tight. And, um, and we made plays later in the second half in an electric building to get it to double figures. Um, you know, the Marquette game in the, in the Big East Finals was, was not – uh, a runaway for us. It was a tight game that we got separation in, in the second half. Um, you know, we've played close games during the year. Uh, you know, I, I just think um, you know the expect um, you know the expectation in, you know in, in the game versus Illinois. Illinois is one of the best teams in the country. You know, one of the best teams in the country. We we expect a forty minute war going into every game that we go into. You know, I know you'll see. You know, the end of that clip when I came into the locker room and said, we just keep blowing these teams out. Well, they missed the first part of that, which was, man, I don't know how we're blowing these teams out in this setting. You guys are special. So we go into every game. You know, with San Diego State, we didn't think we'd be plus 27 on the backboard versus that rebounding team. We didn't think that we would beat a, you know, a team like that, um, you know, that beat the team that, you know, that beat the Auburn team that everyone felt like could make a deep, deep run in this tournament by, you know, by 30. So um, you go into it thinking it's going to be a full 40-minute war, um, you know, and, and, and we've systematically been able to break teams down. That's about five more minutes. Go ahead to the right. Wayne Norman, UConn Sports Network. Dan, you just talk rebounding. These are two of the top 10 rebound margin teams in the country. How do you see the rebounding battle playing out tomorrow? And where do you maybe have an edge? Yeah, it's going to be bloody battle. Um, it's a rebounding war tomorrow, and it's going to be a it's going to be a bloody one. You know, the Big East and the Big Ten, two of the toughest leagues. Um, you know, you get you get real men playing in these two conferences. So, uh, you know, when the ball goes up, you know, whoever's fastest to it, whoever makes that first violent contact, and then continues to improve their position. They're an excellent rebounding team. Um, we're an excellent rebounding team. We both go to the offensive glass. You know, I think tomorrow's going to be just, I think it's going to be a fun game. I think two, the two top offenses in the country, um, you know, play, NBA players up and down, you know, both rosters. Um, you know, I know they're hungry to break through and get to a Final Four. You know, we're, we're hungry to get back to a Final Four. So, you know, we're, we're two of the, you know, two of the truly best teams in the country. Anything else other for Coach? All right. Thanks so Thank much. You. Good luck tomorrow. Yep.